So Mark chapter 7, and beginning at verse 1, and I'm going to read this morning, um, not the whole chapter, but actually until verse 13. I think, I think you'll see that this is a, a unit that Mark has designed for us to look at as one. So Mark chapter 7, and beginning at verse 1, let's hear God's word. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him, that of course is Jesus, With some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is, given to God, then you you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. Immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. This is God's word. Some of you will know that uh, when I was um, younger and in much better shape than I am now, I used to play rugby. And uh, when you play rugby, uh, there are certain techniques that you need to learn in order to not get injured. Um, Well, not get too badly injured, I guess. I don't think there's any way to avoid getting injured at all. But, um, and uh, one of them is how to tackle. And uh, in rugby, and I think it's a little different, I've watched football games, I think in football you're, you're taught to tackle with your head pretty much, which seems madness to me, but I, don't, I know nothing about football, so I'm sure it's absolutely correct and you know, everything. But in rugby, you're, you're taught to tackle with your shoulder and you have to get your head on the, on the correct side. So if you imagine with me, someone's running this way and you wanna, you wanna put them down on that side, you've gotta get your head in the, on the right way so that the weight doesn't come on your neck because obviously if it comes on your neck, you can damage your neck. And sometimes when you're watching a a professional rugby game, they're actually deliberately tackle on the wrong side because if you 
put your neck in the way, you've got extra kind of weight from your spine to, to tackle the person, but you're not meant to do that. It's bad for you. It can obviously, well, it can give you a concussion. It can give you real damage. So there's a right way of doing it, and there's a wrong way. That's so true in life, isn't there? Yeah, uh, it's, it's true in many things in life. It's true in sports. It's true in economics. It's true in business. There's often a right way of doing something in a wrong way. The same is true in religion. And the passage we're looking at this uh, morning, uh, Jesus, and as Mark tells the story of Jesus, he's describing the, the right way of going about um, serving God, pleasing God, uh, following God, and the wrong way. And what, what Mark is uh, doing here with this um, story is he's putting together two components that are designed to teach the same thing. So it's one, and so often with Mark and the way he tells the story of Jesus, there's one big idea that he's teaching from several different vantage points. And here you have a debate. It's a, it's a religious debate. It's a debate between the Pharisees and Jesus and his disciples. And in that debate, uh, Mark is showing how Jesus is identifying the true religion, the right way of serving God, obviously in contrast to the Pharisaic way. They've got it wrong, and they need to be corrected. And he's showing us that there's a wrong way to follow God. And it's, it's so counterintuitive, isn't it? Today we think that if someone is um, well-meaning, they have good intention, then they must be doing it the right way. All that matters is that you're sincere. If someone sincerely wants to follow God, then that's all that counts. But here, the Pharisees, they're certainly sincere. They want to follow God. And yet, according to Jesus, they've got it entirely wrong. And the way they got it wrong is a, is, a, is a very common way that people tend to get it wrong, like that rugby tackle is a common way of getting it wrong. And so Mark is telling this story to show us that there's a, there's a right way to go about it, religion, and there's a, there's a wrong way. And he's, it's so, I mean, if there was a passage in the Bible that is so against the spirit of the age, it would be this one. If this was written today, um, uh, the, the Pharisees wouldn't be criticizing the disciples for doing it wrong, and the disciples wouldn't be criticizing the Pharisees for doing it wrong. They'd all be saying, it's all good, man. Like, as long as you're sincere, what does it matter? But the Bible doesn't tell the story of how to follow God like that. There are wrong ways to go about it, and there are right ways. So there's this debate about what's the true religion what could be more important today? So much religion around today, Islam, Hinduism, many different kinds of Christian denominations. Uh, and then there's also all the kind of secular religiosity with its appeal to transcendence with the, 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 the various rallies that go on, the, the, the gatherings, the sports events, which <laughs> sometimes almost seem to have a religious fervor. You ask yourself, when is, when's the only place that men will sing outside of church? And the answer is at a baseball game. Uh, everyone knows that song, um, apart from the British who don't. But, um, <laughs> and so this, this, uh, this clarity around what is the right way to follow God, what is the wrong way to follow God, is it's so counter-cultural. It's going to be hard for us. To, we're going to have to really lean into it, not only to hear the answer, but actually to believe that Jesus, that Jesus is correct to be correcting the wrong answer. Uh, we, we, know, we understand that there's a right way to tackle and rugby in a wrong way. We understand there's a right way to do mathematics in a wrong way. We understand that there's a right side of the road that you should drive on and the wrong side of the road. The left, by the way, is what you should drive on. But um, we understand that. But when it comes to religion, the predominant attitude today is all roads lead to God. And if you don't think that, then surely you're an extremist. Surely right behind that is violence and aggression. But that, of course, that's not what Jesus is for. He's... he's He's the loving Savior who died on the cross for the sins of the world. 
And yet, he is bold to clarify truth with love. So there's this debate, and then there's a dramatization of the debate at the end, which is, I think, see if you agree with me by the time we finish, but I think the, the woman with the, the daughter who has a, a demon, the reason why that story is stuck here in the way Mark is telling the story of Jesus is to illustrate what he's been teaching in the, in the conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus about the right and wrong way to follow religion. See if you agree with me by the end. So there's first of all the debate that goes from verse 1 all the way to, through to verse uh, 23. And in that debate, uh, the, the issue at hand is obviously uh, washing. But really, it's a bit more than that. There are two things going on behind that issue. And Jesus um, tells us what those two things are. Uh, when he identifies them here in verse 8. He says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. In other words, what's really going on, it's not about just these rather obscure ideas about washing. What's really going on is they're not listening to God's Word, and they're using their traditions to stop them listening to God's Word. Uh, he, uh, He makes it even more clear in verse 13. Thus, making void the Word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. So this is one aspect of this clarity, not human tradition, but God's Word. But the other aspect that is behind this debate about, apparently about washing, and there's more to it than that, is not only uh, God's Word, not human tradition, but also this issue of external purity versus real internal uh, purity. And Jesus um, uh, points this out then at the end of the section. He says, um, well, it's clearest when we listen to what he says to the the disciples. Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? So it's not just about the washings. It's about this idea that Things externally, from outside, can make you pure, whether it's washing or um, food, as Mark uh, interprets it for us, thus he declared all foods clean. No, it's not, it's not the external, says Jesus. Pharisee, you're wrong. It's not the external, it's the internal that must be changed, because in our hearts there's all this evil, um, all these evil thoughts that he lists. It's the internal uh, that that must be changed. The external, you can wash your hands as much as you like, but it's not going to change what's really going on, Jesus is saying. You can eat as special ceremonial food as you like, You can eat as many, you can be as strict as you like about what goes on externally, but it won't make a a bit of difference to what's happening internally. And once we see that these are the two issues at stake, we can see how relevant it is. God's Word and God's Word alone and internal transformation. Those are the, the two pillars that Jesus is saying of true religion. God's Word and His Word alone, that by His Spirit creates internal transformation. John Stott, I was reminded, John Stott was a British preacher from uh, yesterday, um, uh, not y- literally yesterday, but yesterday, you know, he's, he's obviously gone to glory now, he's dead now. And it's, it's a humbling thing, actually. I mentioned John Stott to people today, and that so many people had never heard of him. He was, so, he was like on the front of Time magazine for a while as one of the most influential people in the world, and now he's gone to glory and no one's ever heard of him, and I think that's great. Because our task as preachers is to preach God's Word and then be forgotten. Who was that? Was it um, Zwingli who said that? I can't remember now. See, I get things wrong. Forget me. Listen to the Bible. Um, um, but John Stott said... The work of God is done by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, to the glory of God. That's right. 
It's God's word, not these human, and, but so easy, whether it's external or tradition, so often we get confused about that. Now, let me, let me illustrate that for you so you can see, having identified these two principles, God's word and external versus internal change, let me show you how it still speaks today. First of all, let's think about other religions, Islam. Islam, some of you will know, those of you who studied Islam or aware of Islam, has certain external washings and the certain techniques you have to follow to wash, to be pure. Well, Jesus is saying that's all wrong. Isn't he, isn't he so controversial? Uh, no, Islam, you have it wrong. However much you wash, you will not be pure. Um, it's not the external washings. That's the mistake of the Pharisees. That will not purify you. I suppose the best illustration of this is from William Shakespeare with his play Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, who committed a horrible sin and kept on trying to wash the blood off her hands. And however much she washed, the heart had not changed and she didn't sense forgiveness. No, Islam, you're wrong on that. But of course, in Christian tradition, there have been times when we've got that kind of thing wrong too. We had a baptism earlier at the 9.30 service, and Pastor Ben, who did the baptism, clarified for us correctly that it's not the washing that saves. So we, obviously baptism is commanded in the Bible, and we should be baptized. If you haven't yet been baptized, you should be baptized. But do not think that by being baptized, you'll be saved. That's just water. How, how, how could it possibly purify you before the holy God? And yet, so many religious traditions think it does. An external washing. Or food. We have communion that's a sort of special food. Um, but however much special food you eat, it will not save you. And we clarify that when we uh, take communion as well. It's not going to save you eating communion. There are a lot of people out there who think it will. You see how relevant this is. And where we tend to go wrong is when we put human tradition over the Bible. I had a friend once who was um, before he became a Christian, uh, was in a cult, a sect. And as he came out of the cult, what he said to me, Josh, is they always have another book. So insightful. So uh, rarely will someone come out and say the Bible is in a religious context. Will someone come out and say, the Bible's nonsense, don't believe it. Instead, they'll say, well, the Bible is fine, but we've got this other book. And you can only understand the Bible through that book. That's, of course, what the Mormons do with the Book of Mormon. The Bible, they accept, but you can only understand it through the Book of Mormon. And therefore, of course, they make null and void the Word of God. Same mistake as the Pharisees made in a different contexts, but basically the same thing. Or Jehovah's Witnesses with their Watchtower magazine. The only way you can, they accept the Scriptures, but the only way you can understand the Scriptures is to read the Watchtower. You put it on top of the Bible. Therefore, you make the Bible void. It loses its power in your life, practically. It's a practical rejection of the Bible. And we can do the same in other um, in religious circles closer to us. I, of course, grew up in the Church of England, and in the Church of England there's a prayer book, um, the 1662, which was written by Cranmer, though he put it together from all sorts of other uh, places. And basically, that's a pretty good prayer book. I don't… Uh, basically, it's pretty good. Um, the more recent ones, uh, by the way, are not always so good. Um, but it's basically pretty good. 
But even that, you should not interpret the Bible through it. I've come across people from Anglican traditions who do. They'll say, well, but the prayer book says this. Well, I can, perhaps I can say this because I grew up in the Church of England, but who gives a flying monkey what the prayer book says? I want to know what God says through His Word. Um, I remember some deacon that served with me at another church, and you know that often in our kind of circles, church meetings uh, run according to Robert's rule of orders. And uh, this deacon was being, being a little, um, was a little frustrated about this at one point. He said to me, Josh, who is Robert and why should I follow his orders? And I felt a lot of sympathy for the man. It's like, yeah. Oh, of course it's fine to follow a basic order that's generally accepted, but it should not be on top of the Scriptures. Um, And we so easily do that. We so easily externalize rather than look for the, the harder thing, which is the transformation of the heart. How do you know whether you're stuck in this wrong way of looking at religion. I think because you're feeling uh, the Pharisaic condemnation. Do you notice the feeling? Uh, Verse 2, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled. Uh, Verse 5, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? All this is judgment, isn't it? Condemnation, guilt. In our area, in Chicagoland, there's such a strong religious heritage that oftentimes I find Christians live with this oppressive guilt because they haven't done this, that, or the other exactly correctly. And Jesus has come to free us from all that by God's Word, by the Spirit of God, that then does the work of God to the glory of God. That's the principle. And now he, Mark, then dramatizes it with this uh, Syrophoenician woman. Uh, and I know that there, there are parts of this that people find controversial, but I really believe that if you can grasp it, you won't find it controversial. You'll find it so beautiful. So, verse 25, there's a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit. Stop there. Notice, Mark is deliberately, I think, connecting her issues with the debate. So he's just said, he's, just, he's declared all foods clean. The debate has been what cleans you. How can you be truly clean? Well, here's a woman whose little daughter has an unclean spirit. Same issue. Uh, what is more, the woman was a Gentile or a Greek. Uh, that is, she's from a Hellenistic background. She has Greek pagan culture. She's unclean from a Jewish point of view uh, because she's a a Gentile. And then doubling down on her uncleanness, she's also ethnically unclean. So not only does her daughter have an unclean spirit, and not only is she culturally unclean because she's a Gentile, uh, that is, uh, she's literally, she's a Greek or Hellenistic, her worldview is unclean, but also ethnically, she's non-Jewish, she's Syrophoenician, she's unclean. So here it is being dramatized. What is the right way to get clean before God? Well, it's not the external and it's not human tradition. What is it? So she comes to Jesus and she uh, begs him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now here is the surprise, verse 27. He appears to put her off in the harshest way possible. But a lot of the understanding of this comes down to how you read it. You could read it like this. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Very harsh. Or he could be deliberately dramatizing what the Pharisees thought, which is what I think he's doing. He could have said it like this, let the children be fed first. It's 
It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. In other words, this is something she would expect a Pharisee to say, because it is the kind of thing they did say, we know. He's dramatizing the issue. She answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Or as the Anglican Book of Prayer from 1662, Cranmer puts it, um, Lord, we are not worthy even to eat up the crumbs under your table. She's, she's got it right. And he said to her, for this statement or for this word, you may go your way. That's how Wycliffe translated it, for this word, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter, and the demon, of course, is, uh, is cast out by Jesus at at his word. So here's the dramatization of the, of the issue. A woman, Syrophoenician, Gentile, daughter with an unclean spirit, what's the solution? Washing? Tradition? No. The word of God, by the spirit of God, cast the demon out. I don't know what sort of demonic issues that you personally are struggling with, but I do know, according to Jesus, what our hearts are like. Verse 21, for from within, out of the heart of man, uh, by the way, also woman, um, isn't it funny how we, in our gender political correctness, we're quite happy to say out of the heart of man here, not out of the heart of woman, but of course it means both when the Bible uses this word, out of the heart of humanity. So out of all of our hearts come what? Evil thoughts? <laughs> We're told that our, we are essentially good today. And Jesus says, no, actually, we're essentially evil evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. foolishness. That's what we're like, according to Jesus. And we think a little bit of washing, a baptism, or some communion, or putting on the right clothes, is going to solve the problem. Of course it is not. People get very offended by this kind of language when, it, uh, when the Bible talks to people, about people like this. Um, they think that a preacher like me is trying to give us a guilt trip. I, it could not be further from the truth. I want your guilt to be lifted. But in order for that to happen, we need to face up with absolute frankness to the real issue. Uh, seven new rules to how to be happy are not going to solve the problem. What we need is a spiritual transformation from within. People get so offended by this. The, the hymn that says that we're miserable worms, and they say, well, that's so unkind to people to call them miserable worms. But of course, biblically speaking, to call uh, people miserable worms is not being unkind to people, it's being unkind to worms. Because we are rebels. And what's going to solve the problem? God's Word. That's why we as a church, you'll find this, you come to the, um, the visitor's lunch afterwards, we'll talk more about this. So you come to the membership class, you'll talk more about this. We, we don't stick to the Bible because that's the thing that churches did in the past. We stick to the Bible because it is God's Word by His Spirit that can only do the work that is required. And I'll, I'll close with this. I remember when I was doing a church plant in another part of this country, having a conversation with a pastor of a church that was theologically very liberal, not politically liberal, but theologically very liberal. And of course, they, they hardly opened the Bible at all. 
And uh, we had uh, lunch together. He wanted to find out what we were doing, because at the time, uh, the church was packed and people were coming. And he thought I had some special new technique. Uh, if you've been around pastor circles, you'll know that sometimes, you'll, quite often, there'll be someone who's selling a new technique to get the church to 25,000 in three days without trying, right? And so he was sort of like, what's your new technique? And I said, well, honestly, brother, I, I don't have a technique. We just open the Bible and I do my best to teach it. That's all I, we just teach the Bible. And I'll never forget his response. He looked at me rather confused and then said, well, we've tried everything else. I guess we could try that. And I thought, yes. I said, well, go ahead, you know. It might work. It will work. So don't go away um, from this morning thinking, you know, what a clever pastor who can preach without notes or something like that. But go away with a fresh conviction that only God's Word can do the work of God. And then let us, like the Syrophoenician woman, come to Jesus and say, have mercy, which is essentially what she's saying. So let's do that together in prayer. Our Lord God, we do um, come to you and like the Syrophoenician woman and say, have, have mercy upon us. Uh, even, uh, even the children uh, can eat the crumbs. Or as uh, was, is put in that prayer book, we're not worthy to even do that. But Lord, you are God of love and mercy. So I ask, Lord, that whether it's a, um, a demon of alcoholism, of um, some other addiction, perhaps sexual, Or that something uh, less frontline news in church life, like bitterness towards another Christian, anger or hate. Well, we can talk about these things, we can go to meetings about them, but at the end of the day, we need you, Lord, to come and give us freedom just like you did for that little girl so long ago. So by your Spirit, work among us, we pray to your glory through your word. In Jesus' name, amen.